Okay, welcome to the ELD MOOC. Welcome to this last and final session where the final five projects present their cases. I am Claudia Musekamp and I will be your host today, taking you on a trip around the world to see exciting projects of um, finalists of the ELD MOOC who present us their cases in fighting land degradation. We've received 38 final projects with more than 100 uh, participants making it to the end of this course. We are very happy and very excited about the high quality that we've uh, seen in the final assignments. Bef um, you will receive a certificate for uh, participating in this MOOC. We are currently uh, preparing the certificates. Actually, they are already uh, there, but we have to, uh, uh, we're currently figuring out the way to get them to you. So uh, by the end of this week, you should have uh, received your certificate uh, if um, that applies. Before I will introduce you to the first speakers, let me say a, a few words of thanks to all of those who made uh, this MOOC possible. This is first the ELD team, the ELD Secretariat in Bonn, who made this MOOC uh, possible, who took uh, the courage to do the first GIZ MOOC and who took also the budget to do so. And that is Mark Schauer, Tobias Gerz, Reiter and uh, Clemens Olbrich. So thank you. There's the United Nations University with uh, Emma Kileru, Richard Thomas and uh, Naomi Stewart. Uh, Emma and Richard have prepared the script for this class. Emma has written the script for this class and without it, this course wouldn't have been possible. And we've seen Richard as a wonderful speaker as Emma in the, uh, during this uh, course. Um, so thank again you and Naomi Stewart for preparing the certificates. And I would like also to thank uh, the GIZ team who has worked uh, sort of behind the curtains, in front of and behind the curtains. There's Volker Lichtenthaler, who is uh, sort of the brain behind the MOOC. I think it was his idea to start uh, a MOOC and uh, who has put a lot of work and effort into making this possible. So thanks, Volker. Thanks also Natalie Stewart, who has uh, ha uh, done editing in the cast, and Carlos Wirschmidt, who has been great in uh, helping with all the uh, technical issues that um, came up. And there were many more behind the curtains, uh, as Santiago Am Amaya, who made uh, um, who is sort of the technical enabler, and um, many more who has uh, have helped uh, make the uh, MOOC possible. So today I will take you on a trip around the world. I wish we could do that as a real uh, travel. Uh, today we'll do it online. And this is these are the places I will uh, take you to. First of all, we'll start in India, and I see Mr. Bala Subramanian already um, on the screen. He will be our first speaker, and he is representing the Land Management India team to uh, tell us more about the case that they worked on. Then uh, we will uh, hopefully turn over to 
Mexico, uh, where uh, zero and the uh, recursos, long name recursos course, uh, present uh, their case. Then we'll go over to uh, the Lake Victoria in Africa um, to see uh, how um, land degradation can be fought there. We'll continue to uh, the US, Indiana, in the state of Indiana, Brown State, and we'll hear from Katie Lane about turning Brown State into a national park. And our journey will end in Morocco, that's uh, in the uh, that yellow, on the yellow spot, uh, in Morocco, where we learn about uh, Dra Valley. So welcome to all the finalists, uh, welcome to all the speakers who stand for their teams and who will present uh, their cases to us. And uh, now it's time to turn over to the India team and I will give the microphone to uh, Mr. Bala Subramanian who will present the case of drylands of Ramanathapuram district in Tamil Nadu, India. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I thank the ELD team to give us this great opportunity to interact with everyone and also present our case. Thanks also for our team who was has, who has with us in supporting all this uh, exercise. And I hope uh, we have reached a stage where we can show our work to the entire world. Uh, here again, I'll go to the second slide. Uh, this is the study area, which is South India, Ramnathaburam district, which is notorious for its prosopis invasion, has spoiled all the land, thrown the people out of agriculture, and they have now it has become a charcoal economy. So we thought this is the right case for land degradation due to prosopis or other invasive species, and we have taken this exercise. We have taken just two blocks, highly degraded, and we have in that we have taken just two villages. Uh, you can see in this uh, map two villages which we have marked it, which has uh, two water bodies, around 250 families residing in these two villages, and about 200 hectares area which comes under this study area. Uh, the current scenario this is the current scenario which I was telling, majority of the cultivable land is already lost due to the invasion by prosophis and there is continuous degradation because people left agriculture and they are doing charcoal and other works and there are no other non-farm activities or any industrial activities taking place and majority of the people out of 250 almost close to 60 70 percent has already left the village i am one among them so i thought it's a good case to present my village for improving or avoiding or preventing the further land degradation. What we have done or what we have proposed, we thought the best way is to recover the land for cultivation purposes. And of that, once agriculture develops, we thought we will promote livestock management and all our water bodies, almost all of them, close to 70 to 80 percent of the waterways, water resources, all have been invaded, encroached by this process, as well as some of the human uh, interventions also. As far as the village is concerned, the water is, drinking water is a problem. We are uh, getting water from some centralized uh, river lift irrigation system and also desalination plants. We thought this is one option which we should provide the basic amenities in the village so that people stay. Uh, while conducting the exercise, we have conducted the survey. We have taken uh, one non-demand based uh, because market system, because the data is available. And as far as prosopis is concerned, we have conducted a scenario analysis. We asked the people whether you want to convert the entire prosopis into agricultural land which is occupied or you 
uh, cut down the Portuguese plantation to some extent. Uh, what happened in the exercise after our survey? Uh, 50 more than 50 percent of the people, or close to 70 percent of the people, have told we will we are ready to lose only 50 percent of the land because we already had enough. Uh, expectations from agriculture, which has not come through. Charcoal is giving the economy that is giving us the uh, opportunities for don't spoil us. So we went ahead with the economic analysis, assuming only 50% of post office occupation will be removed and brought back under agriculture. We also given them that option, those who don't want to come back to agriculture, they can go for solar farms, give that land on a long lease, and one more, uh, around these villages, there are a lot of brick and charcoal industries. They are not being charged. We thought we should charge them so that they help this exercise. Uh, that's the way we have uh, worked out the ecosystem uh, valuation. And also there is one biomass power plant which is already running in the nearby Taluk which is totally depending on process we thought we can promote one more. So these are the interventions we have proposed. So this is our future scenario once we implement this idea by stopping or minimizing the continuing degradation, we thought some of the land will come back Here is our exercise which carried out all the financial parameters. We followed a 15%, which normally we follow in India for all rural infrastructure projects as also PPP projects. But this is the opportunity cost per fund in India, which we are using currently. We decided to carry over the project for nine years, assuming uh, this will be, after nine years, we will be able to do some, uh, bring back some of the land into the cultivation or we create some economic activities. And we have spread over this investment, that is initial investment for a period of two years. And one more important one, uh, our planning commission gives us some factors for converting the market price into economical price. But while working out our exercise, we found all the parameters are not available. So for this project purpose, we assume the standard factor of one, which means the market price is taken as the economical price, so it is not realistic. And we have carried out the sensitivity analysis for our investment cost and also agriculture production area. What we found the investment cost is the major factor which may affect and the agriculture production area in the sense how much area can be really converted into agriculture land or should we continue to keep prosophies because prosophies have become a major economy in this area and people are uh, happy with it. So now I will go to the final slide, what we have arrived at. We have reached, if we take only net present value, we reached a positive percent uh, value of 20 lakhs at the end of the exercise. We used the discounting factor 15% for uh, working out the present value of the cost and also the present value of benefits. And we worked out the Economical rate of return as 33% and benefit cost ratio as 1.63. Uh, here again, see, I have shown you the project economics, whatever we have worked out, is sensitive to the investment cost that is recovering all the land from post office and also recovering all the land, which is all the land which is under water resource uh, structures or water bodies. And one more second one which we found was this particular uh, area under post office. In case of investment cost, if it cost escalates beyond 14%, it becomes unviable. The same way if we remove two thirds of the plantation, post office plantation and bring back into agriculture, that is also becoming not viable. So uh, in this case, what we learned was it is very difficult to take post office away from the area and still provide them uh, economical benefits or giving them an alternate uh, livelihood to the people to stay in the village. Uh, during the process, 
we faced some uh, difficulties in the sense the data is we could not authenticate validate at every stage and uh, since i am from that area i could collect some of the major data as so we could uh, at least believe in our exercise it is still possible to do some exercise under ecosystem valuation and recover some of the land and give uh, alternate livelihood opportunity i think i have taken uh, right 10 minutes thank you i will now request dhananjay to if he has anything else to say about our project he can say okay thank you mr balasubramanian for thank presenting you, this case case and Mr. Dhananjaya is also on and he will make the case. Please switch on your microphone so we can hear you. I think the connection is not stable. Uh, Okay, let's try it once again. And there is some echo, I'm hearing that. I'm not sure whether this, you know, there's nothing more to add. So again, I would say thank you, Mr. Balasubramanian, for presenting this great case from the mm -hmm. Land Management India. Thank you. Thank you. Now, thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the recursos, and it's a long name, Economia de Recursos Nacionales in Mexico. Let me make uh, Dr. Ciro the presenter. Here we go. Uh, so, Dr. Ciro will be on in a minute and he will present the case of the team Economia de los Recursos Naturales in Mexico, El Salto in the state of Durango. Um, he will turn on the camera. I can hear you. Yes, I'm here, Claudia. Yes. Okay, we can hear you. Okay. Should I start? Please go ahead. Here is your you. presentation. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to present our project. This is entitled Economic Salvation of the Construction of the Dam in Ejido La Victoria in the Nuevo Durango, Mexico. This Ejido La Victoria is uh, located, I can see the complete, okay. it's located uh, in the state of Durango, and this Ejido has about uh, almost 11,000 hectares of forest. It is close to El Salto City with about 22,000 inhabitants which have, which have water scarcity. The main uh, Ex excuse me, Mr. Ciro, could you turn up your audio a little bit? I'll switch off mine. Uh, makes the audio a little clearer, but please uh, turn up your microphone. Otherwise, it's... Uh... Can you hear me now better? Can uh, you hear me now better? Yes, yes. Okay. The Hida La Victoria is located in the state of Durango with uh, about 11,000 hectares of forest. It is close to El Salto City, where there are about 22,000 inhabitants uh, with water scarcity. 
Uh, and the main, the main products before the project in the, in the Hido are timber, agricultural, agricultural and pecuary products. In the, in the Victoria, there is a basin with uh, 934 hectares in the Presidio River bed. In that place, a dam was established called La Rosilla, which is aimed, aimed to supply drinkable water and domestic water to population of El Salto. And this is the case that we analyzed in this, uh, in this project. The stakeholders, the main, the main stakeholders in, in that area are the 98 expertarios and their families, some of them with small pieces of land and other with a few cattle heads. The population of El Salto is also a, a stakeholder and the producers and consumers of agricultural products coming from this region. We analyzed three scenarios. Scenario one is the initial situation where there are timber harvesting in the basin area, timber harvesting in about 800 hectares, agricultural in 24 uh, hectares, and livestock in about with, with about 90 hertz every five years. The scenario two, I mean, this, this, in, this, this, in scenario one, these activities mean income for the ejidatarios. In the scenario two, with the project, but considering that the ejidatarios would, would pay for all the expenses of the dam construction and maintenance, the scenario is uh, the dam construction as a cost, in which will cover 94 hectares, this, uh, the dam. The protected areas uh, where uh, the, the, the cutting of timber will be forbidden is about seven, 700 hectares. Agricultural livestock will be foregone in this uh, 800 hectares because of the needs of protecting the, the basin. And the provision to, of water to El Salto, which would mean uh, payments of about 20, 27 pesos, Mexican pesos, per each household in El Salto. Scenario three is the same scenario as, as, the, as the scenario number two, but with the difference that the government would pay for the dam construction, the construction and the maintenance instead of the ejidatarios. In the next slide, we can see uh, summary of the cost and benefits. The cost in the year one that we consider is the dam construction cost and the income which is reduced from the agriculture and, and, and livestock activities. In years two to 60, the, the cost will be the, the maintenance cost of the dam and also the income which will be eliminated from agriculture, livestock and timber. As for the benefits, in year one, it will be an additional income from harvesting timber in the area that will be covered with water by the dam. And the, in the years two to 60, the, the incomes will be the payments for water provision to El Salto, and this subsides from government for hydrological and biodiversity services. So we, with these three scenarios, we made three, two estimations. Considering a planning, a planning horizon of 60 years for the project and a 4% discount rate. In estimation one, we calculated the net present value of the incremental benefit by comparing scenarios one and two. Remembering that in scenario two is where the dams costs are paid directly by the hiatarios. In this, in this estimation, the net present value of the incremental benefit is uh, negative with uh, more than 12 million Mexican pesos present, negative net present value. Therefore, under this estimation one, the project will not be attractive or profitable to the ejidatarios of La Victoria. In estimation two, we estimated the net present value of the incremental benefit Comparing scenario one and three, scenario three is the dam cost, cost are paid by the government. 
and in this estimation, uh, the net present value of the incremental benefit is positive with more than 15 million pesos. Therefore, uh, under estimation two, the project is very attractive and profitable for the hectares of La Victoria. And finally, uh, as an analysis, we, we, we took two points of view. One, from the private point of view, Scenario 2 is not viable, viable for the geotarios since they had to pay for the construction and maintenance of the dam and the net present benefit would be negative with more than 12 million pesos negative for the geotarios. From the public point of view, the scenario 2 can be converted to a scenario 3 given a net present value of, uh, of incremental benefit positive with more than, more than 50 million for the geotarios. In conclusion, since uh, given, the, given the need of increasing the supply of water to the inhabitants of, of El Salto, the government decided to go ahead with the scenario three by paying for the construction and maintenance of the dam as government subsides. That is the conclusion of our project and only also to mention that we took uh, a lot of information, most of the information was taken from these two sources in the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ciro. Thank you for the great presentation on El Salto region and comparing uh, different uh, scenarios. Great work, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So I see people clapping. Uh, I will take the opportunity. We, this is the internet in modern times, but the reality is that I have to switch uh, uh, the presentations, take out the old ones, the previous ones, and upload the new ones. So let me do that. And let me say that the next presentation will be about Lake Victoria. So take a minute to relax and uh, think about the India and the uh, Mexico project and let me upload the presentations. Um, okay, we have a little problem because I can't delete the old ones and um, can't upload the new ones. So why is that? I see the discussion is also going on. That is great, but I don't know where it's not working.
Okay, here I am back again. I was kicked out of the meeting, but made it back luckily. Um, currently uploading the files to make sure that we have got one. And I would ask Mr. Fonkinger to get ready for presenting his case of Lake Victoria. So, sorry for the delay, like in old uh, cinemas, but we made it. So, here comes the Lake Victoria, Lake Victoria. and Franz fucking us. So please go ahead. I will turn off my microphone. Franz fucking us and the Lake Victoria team. Thank you very much, Claudia. Hello to everyone out there in the world. Um, also, hello um, from part of the Lake Victoria ecosystem team. Um, as Claudia told already, we worked on the Lake Victoria ecosystem and the Lake Victoria basin. And let me switch over to the first slide, um, where we have some information about the, the background of the lake, um, the, the catchment area, which could also be called the Lake Victoria basin, is about 184 square million, 184,000 square kilometers. And the surface of the lake is about um, a third of it, um, about 70,000 square kilometers, which makes it the largest tropical um, lake in the world. Um, which is very interesting about this um, case is that uh, the, the surface of the lake is, about, is divided um, among three different countries, um, of which Uganda and Tanzania have about um, 30,000 square kilometers and Kenya has a small part of about 4,000 square kilometers. Um, we have also a, a very great variety of different stakeholders. Um, just let me name the, the most important ones. Um, of course, the, the fishermen, um, which is a very big industry for a lot of people there. We have the farmers, um, which are using the land uh, around the lake and also the waters um, flowing into the lake. And we have also, as it, as it is a very densely populated area, a lot of industry and, and factories around the lake. And um, last but not least, there are a lot of local and national uh, organizations um, as stakeholders of the region. Um, it is uh, why, we chosen, why we have chosen this lake. Um, we have they are a very uh, big importance for, for about 30 million people living on the, in the region and living on the, on the resources. And we have Africa's largest inland fishery supported by the lake's waters. And not, um, not to forget, the lake represents a very big, a very big, um, a very big point for regulation of, of a lot of um, services and, and functions in the region, um, just to name the, the flood regulation or the microclimate regulation. So on the next slide, I will tell you something about the, the current scenario, which we find there. As I already told, we have a very densely populated area with um, a lot of urbanizations around the lake and the shores. And we also have a big industry um, which are which which is using also the the waters of the lake, 
and therefore we have a big um, big pressure on the ecosystem uh, on the ecosystem services and on the functions and the resources and um, for example the fishing industry is now struggling uh, a lot because um, the native species are more and more um, more and more decreasing and also the fish stocks are, are decreasing a lot um, so there is this is a big problem which we also focused on in our in our cost benefit analysis um, furthermore we have we have land degrading activities around the lake which um, which um, we found in some sources are affecting about 60 percent of the the whole the whole land area of the ecosystem um, we also um, can can see um, a declining water level um, the the last 30 40 50 years and also a declining water quality as a result of the of the activities around the around the lake um, which of course um, um, have some some costs for for industry for people if they want to use these waters. And we not oh, we not only have a very densely populated area, but also um, an increasing population, a very fastly increasing population, which as a consequence a consequence has um, more uh, industrial activities and more um, urban areas. And uh, last but not least, uh, there are some dams around the lake, which are uh, predominantly used for the power generation, and which also have a big influence in the in the water level of the lake. Um, on the next slide, um, we asked ourselves, what can we do about this? How can we better this this current status of the lake, and how can we how can we perhaps um, find some solutions for the problems uh, which are present there? And we asked ourselves, um, can we do, or what can we do different from, from the business as usual um, scenario? And we, here we found the, some, some tools. And first of all, we were thinking about of implementing uh, regulations and rules for the industry, for the farmers, for the for the fishermen, to avoid the the over exploitations of resources, and to to finally reach uh, a regeneration of, for example, uh, considering the lake, the the fish stocks, and also the the native the native species and the the native biodiversity of the lake. So to make it a, a more stable a more stable um, water system. We also, um, considering the land use around the area, around the, around the lake, we um, are thinking about implement, implementing sustainable agricultural practices such as agroecology, organic um, farming practices. Um, and in the end, we want to reach a restoration of the water quality and the water level and also are thinking about um, implementing some alternative energy sources like solar or biomass as we would have to down regulate the hydropower generation of the dams um, all these measures will all these tools will just be um, active if we really have uh, the compliance of of all the stakeholders and also an, an which is very important, uh, a big um, contribution of all the three countries, all the three stakeholder countries there, which would have to coordinate a lot, uh, a lot in this uh, work. Let me then tell you something about the cost-benefit analysis. We conducted the, the analysis for the fishing sector, as it, as it is the most important um, uh, industry there with a very big value. and as there are also a lot of information available on these sector. Um, we considered for the analysis a discount rate of 8% um, based on the following factors. For example, we thought about the demographical situation of the countries 
which are generally which have generally uh, a lot of their population in the in the younger years, so below 15 years, below 20 years, which um, we thought that is a factor that uh, the future is, is very important because these people will have to live a lot of more years on this ecosystem, so we can't allow to, to degrade it very fast in, in, in the next 10, 20 years. So we also um, thought about the development status um, of the countries, which generally is considered in economical terms um, low, so which is also an indicator for for a higher discount rate. Um, let me tell you about three more factors. Um, we also um, conducted a stakeholder survey, survey which uh, was more or less a simulation, um, as we uh, weren't uh, able to to connect us to the local stakeholders. But um, there we found that stakeholders prefer in the current um, situation um, less benefits and uh, more benefits on the long term. So we thought about this would be a higher discount rate too. And we also found numbers uh, of uh, older discount rates considered in older surveys. For example, we found one which used 17.2%. Uh, which was uh, a few years back the, the rate um, charged by the central bank of Tanzania and the current, but this was, uh, we thought it was very high and we, we uh, investigated in the current um, rates and we found about um, values of between 18 and 13 percent. So our 8 percent value is really um, moving between these uh, numbers. And we also thought about the, the opportunity costs, um, which would be um, the, the interest earned by placing the money in, in bank accounts. But there we found a great variety and could not really stick on these uh, numbers. Let me now present you the, the results of the analysis. Um, the, we just conducted it for the fishing sector as there were a lot of numbers available. And as you can see here in the second part of the without project, the current scenario project um, status, we have benefits in the first year, current benefits of about 600 million US dollars. And um, we have also found some service which say that there, uh, that it is possible on to use the, the the fishing stocks in, in a sustainable manner and therefore generate um, benefits of about 800 or 850 million dollars. So this is what we considered in our scenario for the next five years. Um, in the with project scenario, we can see that the benefits drop a lot in the first year already, um, which is a result of the implementation of a lot of regulations. But we can also see that it uh, more than doubles in the five years because um, we considered that the, the better quality of the lake um, will also produce better fish and the regeneration of the fish, fish stocks in the first years can be uh, harvested in the, in the last years of our project. So we have some costs about, of $50 million in the first year and $25 million um, from the second year onwards which generates net benefits, rising net benefits, um, up to $825 million in the last year. Um, in the without project, we can see that the benefits go down of, uh, by, or, or, or cut by the half from $600 to $300 million by further degrading the fish stocks. Um, we have no costs and therefore the net benefit is the same as the benefit. Then we calculated the, the net benefit, the incremental net benefit in, in dollars, and we see that the first two years um, would imply um, negative values, and from the third year onwards we have positive values. Um, considering all the, the discount rate and the discount factor, in the end, we present an economic net present value of um, 200 of nearly $300 million, 
which um, which shows us that the project is worth undertaking because we will generate on the long term or on the mid term on uh, five years uh, a positive value a very positive value and um, also discounted on the on the actual on the current um, present value and as we consider the project of about 10 years uh, onwards we still could say that in about 10 years we still the, the economic net present value will rise, will rise more. So these are the results of our team. Thanks uh, a lot for listening. And if there are questions, we are all online here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Franz. Uh, we can take one or two questions. There was one about research uh, uh, discount factor and another one one about the techniques used to restore water quality maybe you could briefly <coughs> comment on that or answer them in the chat meanwhile um, I, yeah go ahead just briefly on the on the water quality we thought about um one thing as i told the the implementation of of sustainable agricultural practices um, which uh, would include the non-use of chemicals, of pesticides. So this is one thing. And the other thing would be that we um, put regulations on the, on the industry so that they have to treat uh, their waters when they, when, they, um, when they flow it in the, in the lake. Okay, and the short comment on discount rate. Yes. Um, what exactly was the question? Sorry. Uh, uh, whether eight percent is a realistic uh, discount rate? Um, as I told you about all the factors we considered, we considered a, a, a yes, a realistic rate. Hmm. Okay, maybe you could, uh, we can take uh, that question up in the forum. So, Franz Fockinger, thanks again for a great presentation. Thank you. I see people. Thank you, clapping. Claudia. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you to the Lake Victoria team. I know that other members of the team are online. Okay, thank you. Our trip around the world has led us to India, to Mexico, and uh, to the center of Africa. Now we have two more presentations. We have had three uh, charming gentlemen guiding us uh, through the countries, and now we have two more lady guides. And this is the next one will be Katie Lane present, presenting the case of the US, uh, the state of Indiana and uh, Brown State, uh, turning Brown State, Brown County State Park into a national park. Welcome Katie Lane. Let me make you presenter. Okay, Katie Lane, please go ahead. I've you have now the opportunity to speak. I'll switch off my microphone. Please go ahead. Good day to everybody, and thank you for being here. I'm Katie Lane. I'm a member of the Culture and Environment team, and for you today, we presented a proposal for our project of turning the Brown County State Park and the town of Nashville, Indiana into a national heritage area. Sorry about that. Um, the land benefits, oh, Claudia? Yes. Claudia, this is not the latest version of the uh, proposal. Uh, Okay. Um, that's, that's okay. We'll just, we'll make this work. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. 
Um, let me let me go back. Sorry about this. Okay, this slide's going to show a little bit about what happens when land is undervalued. As we all know, it leads to many things, including poverty, increasing population, reduced per capita income. It's non-sustainable, and it just really reduces productivity on a huge level. The next slide shows a little bit about land degradation. We have done, we did many studies in our team throughout the United States looking at national heritage areas and turning them into something that is more productive. There's a Great Basin National Heritage Area, there's a Blue Ridge National Heritage Area, and then the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area. It is our belief that the town of Nashville, Indiana and the Brown County State Park would be a really good fit to turn into a national heritage area. We also believe that by doing this, we are gonna reduce the negative consequences of land degradation, which like we talked about before, leads to food insecurity, increased pests, a reduced availability of clean water. It also increases vulnerability to climate change, thus increasing biodiversity loss. We further believe that through the benefits of sustainable land management, we begin to secure environmental services, we increase food security, and we help to alleviate poverty. About the Brown County State Park itself, it's located in the heart of the Midwest, Indiana. It's about an hour south of the capital of Indiana, which is Indianapolis. It happens to be the largest state park in the state park system. Nearby is a federally protected historic village site. The exact location of this site is undisclosed for fear of vandalism. In the early 1900s, heavy logging was done throughout the area, resulting in dramatic deforestation and erosion. The population declined so rapidly that the area itself was no longer viable. It took until about 1980 for the population to return to where it was in the early 1900s. Like I said before, the Brown County State Park is a very unique area. The architecture and the engineering is like none other in the state. We're known for covered bridges. There are examples of Greek revival construction, original log, log cabins, as well as world famous architects and designers working in the area. We also are an artist crossroads, not necessarily the state park, but the town of Nashville, Indiana itself. Uh, T.C. Steele was a very famous artist who lived and worked in the area, along with Adolf and Aldous Schwick, Schwick sorry, Schwick, William Zimmerman and Gustav Brahman. The most, like I said, in the Brown County State Park is the most visited park in the state of Indiana. Each year we draw in more than 1.3 million visitors. The park itself offers dramatic views from its high elevations. We have numerous camping sites. We offer horseback riding trails. There are over 20 miles of hiking trails from easy to rugged. There are two man-made lakes for fishing. We offer a lodge, and it's known as one of the premier mountain biking destinations in the Midwest. Nashville, Indiana, the town, is known for having a thriving tourist industry. Technically, it's considered a historic artist colony, and it was settled in 1836. The galleries and the shops within the town feature original artworks produced by resident, or resident artists. Internationally and regionally known musicians perform on stages throughout the community and natural beauty abounds. What I wanna do at this point is quickly explain what a national heritage area is and why we think it would be a great fit for the town of Nashville, Indiana and the Brown County State Park. A national heritage area is a place where natural, 
cultural and historic resources combine to form a cohesive, nationally important landscape. Basically, national heritage areas are lived in landscapes. They're grassroots, they're grassroots organizations, community driven, and they support heritage and conservation. National heritage areas leverage funds for long-term support for projects. They also foster a place of, or a pride of place and create an enduring stewardship ethic. They also serve many important functions. They tell nationally important stories about the origin of the area. They collaborate, collaborate with communities to determine how to make heritage relevant to local interests and needs, as well as on a national level. Through public and private partnerships, national heritage entities support historic preservation, natural resource conservation, recreation, heritage tourism, as well as educational projects. Here's where we get to the economics of this. This is where it gets super exciting. The economic impact of the 21 national heritage areas in the Northeast region of the United States combined for a total of 5.4 billion US dollars. They helped to support 66,800 jobs and they generate $602.7 million in local and state tax revenue. The economic impacts of Yuma Crossing, which is a natural heritage area of similar size to Brown County, came in at just around $23 million. What happened at Yuma Crossing was that they went in and they restored natural wetlands to the existing level that they once were, as well as connecting nature and heritage. The economic impacts of Yuma Crossing, like we said, were huge. And the similarities between these two areas indicate to us that National Indiana and Brown County State Park would thrive as a national heritage area. Not only do you increase income stability, but you allow for funding to complete park projects. Let's new slides going here. Ah, I see what's happened now. It seems as though the presentations kind of combined themselves. Very interesting indeed. So what we're going to do is keep on rolling with it. Now I've lost all my slides, Claudia. Um. Okay, Katie Lane, I'm not sure what happened. It obviously the the platform got a little bit confused right. um, with the uploading because I had uploaded another, another version. Uh, maybe you right. can continue like this. I'm going to continue like this, but unfortunately, the end slides that show our benefit transfer methodology are not appearing, nor any of our tables seem to be appearing at this point that hold all the economic computations. Oh, okay. mm. Once again, I apologize for this. I have to apologize. It stops with Yuma Crossing, so I apologize for the confusion. I can go ahead and speak briefly about the economics and basically what we did. We used a benefit transfer methodology, as I had said before. We figured the discount rate to be at about a 10% factor, as that's regarded as a moderately conservative value. We figured the visitors from last year's data was actually 1.3 million a year. 
However, we believe that because of construction, that might drop down to about 1.2 million a year, simply because people would avoid the inconvenience of the construction. Um, but once we put everything into place, we thought that the area would end up drawing about 1.5 million people just the first couple of years, which once again is a very conservative thought. Um, we based everything out. The cost with the projects, we came up with about 5.8 million U.S. dollars a year with a benefit of over 11.6 million just in the first year. We went ahead and carried that out through years two, three, and four, keeping our um, benefits about the same. We ended up coming out with a benefit to cost ratio of 102% which means that this would definitely be, a, definitely be a viable program. And I'm just gonna end at that point, if that's all right with everybody, since the presentation seems to not be working. Thank you, Ms. Kate. Katie Lane, thanks for a great presentation, and my apologies that the presentation didn't work uh, properly. Obviously, it got confused with the different uploads. So uh, I guess all of us can say that we would love to come to Brown County and be uh, part of the tourists that you are envisioning uh, over there. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank your you. Words. Thank you. Okay, we are now traveling to our last stop on our trip around the world, going um, from the US to Morocco. And uh, now I would like to ask the team that presents the Dra Valley case uh, to get ready. My apologies, the system here come, seems to not go well, sorry. Hi, can everyone hear me? Awesome. Hi everyone, I'm Barbara and I'm going to be presenting um, the case study for my group. I just wanted to apologize, there's actually a fire alarm going off in my building right now, so you might be hearing the beeping. Um, I think I'm okay, so but I might just have to leave, so I'm really sorry about that. It's going to make the presentation really interesting. Um, so this presentation is about a water pricing scheme in the Drab Valley. The Drab Valley is in a, sorry, I'm just trying to say this, slide. there we go. So the Drab Valley is in southern Morocco in the desert area, and it actually gets its name from uh, the River Drab, which starts in the high Atlas Mountains and runs all the way into the Atlantic Ocean. And the area we selected for our case is called Ternata, and it's one of the oases in the valley. 
The economy of Teutnata is very dependent. It's an oasis, so it's quite small. Um, and it depends on agriculture, particularly dates, uh, palm dates. So palm dates are cultivated and sold on international and national markets. And that is the main cash crop for the oasis. Um, because the economy is so dependent on agriculture, most of the land is cultivated in the way that you can see in the image. So the circle shows a palm date tree that's being grown with other crops, in this case wheat, and this is very typical of the area. Um, it's important, uh, one important point is that Mar while Morocco is one of the top producers in the world in terms of gross volume of dates, the productivity of the palm date trees in Morocco is um, actually quite low compared to world standards. And so that's quite important, has a lot of implications. And this is even worse in the Dra Valley as the trees have an even lower productivity than other Moroccan palm date trees. So obviously, agriculture in a desert area, there needs to be irrigation because there's not enough rainfall. And the way this is done in Ternata is um, through these canals. These are actually um, typical canals, uh, very traditional, and they used to direct the flow of water from the dry river to the crops. Because as I said, it's a desert area, there's a lot of loss of water to evaporation, so it's not very water efficient. In the past uh, few years, as uh, the river has been drying up because of overuse and because of uh, changes in the climate, so lower snowpacks in the mountains, there has been an increased use in groundwater. So again, the canals are used to um, uh, to channel the groundwater. However, um, the increased use of groundwater has created some problems. One of them is it's being used unsustainably. So the aquifers are uh, the level of the aquifers are going really low. And this is creating lots of problems like land degradation. And Katie Lane had a great slide about that. So I'm not going to go over it. Um, another important note is that right now, farmers do not pay for water. They just pay for the cost of maintenance of the canals and for pumping the groundwater if they use that. Um, as someone mentioned in the comments, the land is indeed very saltish. Um, the white thing that you can see in the pictures is actually salt and there's quite a lot of it and this has been made worse by the use of groundwater just because of the area groundwater has more salt does not proper drainage so the salt accumulates and further de uh, contributes to degradation of the land so this is just a summary slide of the problems i'm sorry there we go this is just a summary slide of the problems uh, facing this land, as I, I've already went through most of them. And um, the one thing, the one factor that we found that linked them all was water. So that's what we decided to center our intervention on. So what was our intervention? So first of all, we forbid the use of groundwater. We imagined a scenario where we are we were able to restrict this use, and if people use groundwater, they would face a fine and we would be able to catch them. So that's the first part of the scenario. The second one is um, the, water, the, the paper use for the water. So it's quite simple in a way, but it's quite complicated. So we were very lucky. We found that there had been studies that had been done in this region that had established um, what would be a good price according, using the method marginal willingness to pay for um, farmers to pay for water. And that price was uh, 25 cents per meter cube of water used. About 60 million uh, meter cubes of water used per year in Ternada. So this would um, bring in about $14,000 per year. It would bring in, but it would also cost farmers $14,000. Um, the money would be collected by a local government branch and put in a trust fund and reinvested in the local economy. So the money, so ideally the money would stay in Ternada, just in a different way. So obviously we're adding $14,000 in cost to farmers. And for this to be viable, there had to be a way to compensate for it. And the way we found this was to link um, the introduction of a water paying scheme with a drip irrigation scheme. We assumed a fairly short lifetime of five years for the drip irrigation. Um, and the reason uh, we chose it is because uh, this technology has been found to reduce amount of water, the amount of water used between 50 to 90%, which is huge. And it might even be more um, in Ternata, considering that they were using open air canals, so there was a lot of evaporation. And this also helps increase crop productivity both because it will stop the increase in salinity of the land, which is a big problem, 
and just the water gets to the plants better. Um, and obviously, in this case, it will also help decrease expenditures of farmers, both on water and also in terms of labor days. So we thought this was a good idea. We wanted to know if it was, so we conducted a cost-benefit analysis. We made our cost-benefit analysis as conservative as possible, so we used the lowest values we had for our benefits and the highest values for cost. So the benefits were minimized, cost were maximized, and uh, we used a discount rate of 95% because uh, considering the ecosystem and the way of life, people are much more concentrating on the present than the future, so we really wanted the future to be worth more than the present. So what, was, what were the results? Um, according to our cost-benefit analysis, it, the net present value of the five-year intervention is really good, so we should be doing this intervention. Um, what was interesting and I think is really important was that the positive benefits financially started in the third year of the project. So of the five years, the first two years are negative, and third year we're seeing uh, positive financial benefits. So according to this, we should go ahead with the project. However, we have some important caveats that uh, we feel are important to mention. The lifetime of the project, we said five years. Um, but it might be that the irrigation will not, the technology will not survive in, for five years and under the desert sun. It might only be viable for three years, in which case our, our cost benefit analysis would be, look completely different. Um, it was probably would be really hard to restrict the use of groundwater. Right now, people only pay for the fuel to pump the groundwater out. Um, if the price of surface water uh, is higher than the cost for people to use groundwater, there's an incentive for people to go to that, even if it's forbidden. And because of the difficulty of enforcing the restriction, they may not even pay the fine. Um, there's also the, the difficulty in collecting the funds for the water use. So the, these are more kind of technical points. Um, and a really, really important one, we feel, is also that because of time constraints when we designed this project, we weren't actually able to talk to stakeholders, particularly farmers. And this intervention is really dependent on how farmers act and what there were some assumptions made about what they would see as problems. So we would definitely need input from them. And this is it. So yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Barbara Johnson, for a great presentation on the Dra Valleys. Thank you for the team with a long name, desertification, drought, land degradation, drought in Africa. Uh, thank you for presenting and bringing those great uh, pictures to us, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I would say that we have uh, come to the end of our trip around the world. We have explored some of the sites uh, that are close to your heart and uh, that uh, you would wish land degradation to an end. I think uh, this MOOC has been a wonderful opportunity to uh, connect, connect with other people around uh, the world to, who are into fighting land uh, degradation. To me, it has been a wonderful experience. I'll miss uh, our Wednesday afternoon sessions in the future, uh, but I hope that you will stay in touch and connect uh, through the uh, ERD MOOC platform. We'll be sending out a, a final newsletter this week with more information on where to get the uh, recording and uh, where to uh, get the certificates and how to upload, uh, how we will uh, upload the final project so you will get all the information. But uh, before we close and we come to the fun part of uh, putting on the webcam, uh, I would uh, 
ask uh, Volker Lichtenthaler to take the mic. Volker Lichtenthaler of GIZ who wants to say a few words. Here we go. Volker, uh, please. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Claudia. Um, I don't want to say um, many words. I just wanted to, um, at the beginning, we thank each other and so on. I just wanted to say on behalf of the team, um, thank you very much, Claudia, for your great work and um, what you have done. Um, it wouldn't have been the same without you, definitely. A uh, really great job, and we really enjoyed that very much. So I put some flowers here. I hope you can see it. Thank you very much, <laughs> virtual ones. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and also on behalf of the team, of course, um, many thanks to all the participants, because they are team, of yeah. course, and most important um, players, so to speak, in this um, project. Uh, we had, um, as I said already, thank the team, uh, the ERD team, and, and you and you and everybody. So I just thought, let's finish with you, Claudia. Thanks again very much, and the participants, of course. So I hand over back to you, okay? Thank you, Volker. Thank you for the flowers. And now uh, Mark Schauer has raised his hands and uh, I, I think he would like to say a few words. Mark, please go ahead. Mark, you may want to start. Um, Bye, you go. Hey, um, I didn't bring any flowers, I'm sorry, but I want to say thank you to Claudia as well, and I wanted to say thank you to all the participants in this meet here. Um, we very much overachieved what we initially um, hoped to receive from this forest here. There was so strong um, support from you guys in here, from in the working group, with perfect and fabulous results coming out of this, that um, initially we were not sure if we wanted to continue this platform or if we wanted to continue this exercise. But now um, we will keep up, we've decided that we'll keep this platform going, that we will um, have something like a MOOC 2.0 coming up as well. And I'm not sure how this would look as we, uh, what this would exactly look like, but um, we'll be working on this from the ELD team and GIZ team. And um, we would like to create from the results which we've seen today and which we've received in the course of this uh, very cool exercise, some kind of practitioner's guide from ELD. So you'll hear from us pretty soon on this. And we'll keep feeding info on ELD and related information to this platform here. So stay tuned and Thank you all for being with us here. It was really very, very interesting experience for us. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark Schauer from the ELD Secretariat. So, thank you. And uh, we have come to the end of our session. And uh, we now come to the fun part, and I'm going to switch on all the webcams. We may have to switch off the recording before. Um, so,